Hey everybody, welcome to our podcast today. This being the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode four of season three. Uh, excited to be with y'all. Yeah, it's going to be good. I got to make sure. Oh, go ahead. What? No, I'm happy to be here too. Oh, good, good. Of good. course. Uh, I had to throw out that y'all because just before we went live, Matthew and I were talking about country western music. <laughs> yep. And yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm How sure I used I used to listen to it, but not as much anymore. Yeah, well, it's that's what we we're talking about, like how it's not totally country music now. Not the like same the country, anymore. Right. Yeah, it's, it, a it's different. What, it's what I said is uh, pop music with a twang. <laughs> I think that's accurate. If you if you play a pop music jam, but you sing it with a twangy voice. <laughs> then uh then that counts as country music these days <laughs> <laughs> it's about right it's about right i really have an appreciation for uh for the old you know the older true like western style music the wife and kids and i went to uh the bar j wranglers in jackson hole wyoming a couple hmm. weeks back uh, which is a family tradition of sorts. Uh, we've we've gone not every year, but the last few years we've gone every year. Uh, well, they didn't. Yeah, they they did have it. Last, they were shut down for part of last summer, but they opened up, and we were able to go. Uh, we went the year before. We probably went the year before that. Anyway, they they're uh, um, you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's a Western you know show. Like they they you know they they do uh, you know serve you up. Uh, kind of a traditional style meal, like something akin to like a chuck wagon style meal with some mod mod yeah. more modern modifications. And then they entertain you with like an hour or two of uh, just classic Western style music. And uh, it's a good time. And uh, this, this season is their last. They uh, decided to retire after this season hmm. and sell off the business. So, so it was good to go uh, pay him one more visit and, and have a good time. Yeah. Anyway, hello, Timothy. Uh, and hello, Mark. Podcast about a toy gun. Well, depending on who you ask and when you ask, you, I don't know. I, I Maybe I'll get myself in trouble for saying this, but I almost consider guns to be toys to an extent. They're grown-up toys, toys, right? They're not. They're not toy toys, but uh, they are my hobby and my enjoyment. So uh, to me, they are my toys. And so, yes, are we talking about a toy gun today? I, I suppose we could be. <laughs> but that's going to be an interesting conversation to be had here today. Talking about the Block 19 from Culper Precision. Mm -hmm. Been getting a lot of uh, attention in the media in the last 24 to 48 hours. Controversial. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, Mark. I see you. <laughs> All righty. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the recorded portion of the show. If this is your first time joining us, uh, we do these episodes every Wednesday. We, we usually do two episodes every Wednesday. It's supposed to have a later episode today, but I don't know if Jacob's going to be available for that. So, um, and, and Matthew's not available either. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to do there, but we'll see if we can figure it out. If we don't make it happen, then we'll get it rescheduled for, uh, well, tomorrow's tricky because we have, uh, a company wide meeting that lasts most of the day, but, uh, if not tomorrow, then perhaps Friday. Hmm. Yeah. Although Friday, I will not be around now that I think about it. I'm shooting a match. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if this is your first time here, uh, normally we have two episodes every Wednesday, uh, kind of in the afternoon, early evening hours, depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, yeah. So these are live YouTube and Facebook live shows, but uh, um but the, the part that we're about to begin is what's recorded and uploaded to the podcast, which you can find on any of your common podcast player type apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, 
uh, Audible, we're on there. We're also on Spotify, TuneIn Radio, all that stuff. So, um, guys, if, if again, if, if you're just catching this and you normally watch these live, don't forget that you can listen to the podcast anytime using the podcast apps of your choice. Yeah. Let's do it. Going live or hitting the record button, if you will, in three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, Season 3, Episode 4. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. Brought to you by XS Sites. And today is Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. As of the recording of this show, I am your host, Riley Bowman. And I'm joined today by co-host and producer, <laughs> Matthew Marister. Yeah, man, I'm here. And as you said, the date, you know, I made the outline, but you said the date, uh, July 14th. And I had a look because I'm like, it can't be the 14th already. Halfway but, through July already, right? Yeah, I, I, like, I can't believe man. it. Yeah. So we're we're cruising, man. Yeah. Yeah. Just a month ago, it was Flag Day. Yep. Yeah. Which means just three weeks ago is my birthday. yoo -hoo. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, this uh, being, hey, it's a, a news and gear reviews episode, so it's always a fun time as we talk about and share with you the most recent industry news, um, and also share with you a couple gear reviews. And uh, I've got I've got mine right right here, so we'll talk about that later in the episode. It's a, a holster product I had the opportunity of of testing and trying out, and I promised I would. Uh, talk about it good or bad on the podcast with the owner of the company. We'll talk about and introduce who that is or which company that is here in a little bit. Today's episode is sponsored, brought to you by the ready up gear laser dot trainer cartridge. These are the dry fire laser cartridges that are sold by readyupgear.com. That's the website you can find them at. I find them to be, a an, an invaluable piece of training gear paired with software like the laser x application for the purpose of gathering measurable and useful data mm -hmm. in dry fire training uh, that's one of the long time challenges of dry fire training is how like for me, Matthew, it's not just about put this laser cartridge in your gun and then look at red dots on the wall as you shoot, you know, your target, your imaginary targets with your laser out of your gun. Like it, it's, it's, it's gotta be more than that for me. Like that's okay. At the very least, you're learning to hold the gun steady as you press the trigger. Cause if you're not, you're going to see that, that red dot of the laser streak as opposed to being a dot. Like that's that's helpful. At the very least, you're getting some trigger presses and getting maybe a little more familiar with the trigger and the operation of your gun. But I think we got to take it further than that. And pairing the laser dot trainer from Ready Up Gear with dry fire software that reads laser hits on targets, such as laser X from laserapp.com, that's where I think there's some huge, huge, huge value. And that is, hey, I want to time my draw to first shot in dry fire. Mm -hmm. Or I want to time other things. And you can go see the Shooter Ready Challenge videos on ShooterReadyChallenge.com. And I actually see recently I've done some episodes uh, where I've given examples of how you can get gather some of that data. So anyway, guys, check out the Ready Up Gear Laser Dot Trainer uh, on readyupgear.com and if you don't have one why not like go check it out they're relatively inexpensive easy to get started and set up and they generally ship pretty fast too so check one out today readyupgear.com look look for the laser dot trainer you might find some other great products and gear on readyupgear.com today's other episode sponsor is guardian is the 2021 guardian conference uh, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, later this year, September 16th through the 18th or 17th to the 19th, somewhere thereabouts. And it, it's confusing to me, by the way. People are like, well, why don't you know the exact dates of your own event? Well, that's because I'm there on the ground from like the 15th to the 20th <laughs> or something. So I just know it's somewhere in that range. But uh, anyway, guys, 
we got some fantastic trainers. Uh, Larry Vickers still scheduled to be there. We've got Spencer Keepers. We got myself. We got Matt Little. We got Chuck Haggard. Uh, Samuel Middlebrook from Active Self Protection and, and Red Hawk Firearms Training. A uh, bunch of other instructors I'm not bothering to mention here right now at this time. Just go check it out. Check out all the details at guardianconference.com. And I've teased this before, but we are actually getting closer to setting this up. I know a big, huge concern for many people has been ammo. Now, ammo is starting to come around a little bit. I just got an email notification a little bit ago from a company uh, showing they had some in stock and I, I didn't see the email for like an hour and thought, Oh, I'm sure it's gone. And then clicked on the link and no, they still have a bunch in stock and price was fairly reasonable. Like the lowest I've seen in a while from a major retailer. So, uh, it's coming around, but it's still somewhat tough to find at times. So just know that we're getting very close to being able to offer some, a limited quantity uh, exactly how much that would be remains to be seen, but being able to offer some ammunition for purchase by those that will be attending the Guardian Conference. So if you've been holding back because you're like, I don't know if I can get the ammo or I don't want to deplete my current stock of ammo, you can buy some ammo along with your ticket to the Guardian Conference for a reasonable price. And if you've already got ammo, you've already purchased ammo, already whatever, or you already purchased your ticket, we'll have a means that you can uh, uh, be able to still get in on that deal while it's available. And we'll, I'll, we'll let you know when uh, we have that all set up and live. So anyway, guys, check out the Guardian Conference, guardianconference.com to, uh, yeah, to, to get signed up today. I mean, tickets still available. Uh, we're not sold out yet, but you know, we could be sold out. So don't delay. Make your plans. Make your travel plans. It's easy to travel to Oklahoma City. You know, for miss, for many of you, it's a relatively, it's within a day's drive because we ch we chose a, a central location in the country. But also flights in and out of Oklahoma City are usually pretty reasonable too. So guys, check out guardianconference.com. Buy your ticket. Still have the early bird price available, but that's not a guarantee forever. And soon we'll have some ammo able to be purchased as well. So even if you buy your ticket today and the ammo option isn't on the site yet, don't worry. You'll get notified when ammo is available and you can still contact us and get and get some if, you, if you'd like to. But it's Good only going to be available for those attending the event. Nice. Yep. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, and that's a great point, Mark. Mark on Facebook says, also when you buy the Laser Dot Trainer cartridges, they come with a free month of of the laser software, LASR, the laser activated shot reporter software from laserapp.com. Uh, thank you. I, I sometimes forget that. So uh, that's a great point. And so you get started right away with a free month of laser X. You can try it out, see if you like it or don't like it. Uh, I, I think you're going to like it obviously, and it's going to work really well with your cartridge. So check it out. Well, let's get into our industry news, Matthew, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Now, first up, uh, some friends of ours, Culper Precision. I think you had them do your optic cut on yep. your Archon Type B, right? I did, yep. yep. They're one of the few shops out there I know that they kind of specialize, actually, in doing some custom work on those Archon Type Bs. They're not super common guns, so not everybody touches them. Mm -hmm. um, but Culper Precision is a long, they're longtime friends of ours. Uh, founded by a, a friend of mine and Jacobs, uh, Br his name's Brandon. Uh, he's a great guy. He's work. He's been working very hard for a number of years to, uh, you know, to make a name for himself in this industry. So he started Culper Precision a few years back. He's been doing very well with that. Doing a lot of custom work, cool, you know, gun builds. They do anything from precision rifles to ARs to Glocks and other handguns. Uh, custom modifications, slide cuts, uh, uh, custom Cerakote jobs, all that kind of stuff. And I remember uh, hearing a, a while back that they were thinking about doing this Block 19, as they call it. And they finally got it ready and, and, and sort of released it to the public, if you will, like actually showcased it at a shooting event in Utah that's called Shuta, which is an annual event. People come together, uh, vendors, manufacturers, uh, and they shoot guns and showcase guns and other gun-related products. 
and have a great time for a weekend. Uh, and uh, the block the block nineteen was quite popular, <laughs> from what I've heard. I mean, it got a lot. I got it got a lot of attention. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with those of you that are viewing our episode here live with us today. But uh, yeah, the block nineteen is essentially a Glock nineteen convert. Well, not converted necessarily, but milled to have Lego like. You know what do you call it? The the you, everyone knows what Legos are, right? So it has the little bumps, if you will, right. the little circular bumps that Legos use to attach with. And so this Glock 19, that's what it started out as, has these little bumps milled into the slide, and then the grip itself is stippled. Okay, uh, probably done with a laser, I'm guessing, uh, to uh, have similar, you know, looking bumps on the grip portion of the gun. And then the whole thing's colored in the classic red, green, yellow, blue, you know, the classic Lego cl colors have been around since the beginning. And then they, they even managed to use actual Legos to assemble front and rear sights <laughs> and a kind of fake mocked up red dot optic, if you will, <laughs> uh, which, you know, obviously is not, super functional but it you know it's just fun and kind of funny right like and that's really that's brandon's whole point uh when he came up with this he, he said this is a fulfillment of a dream he grew up playing legos he built play guns out of legos and he just this was sort of like an, an homage to his love for legos uh and he's very he was very careful when this was listed on the site to not reference lego the brand uh, but, uh, it's, you know, it's apparent to anybody looking at it, what it was inspired by and actual Legos could attach to it. Uh, this got picked up by, I mean, we're looking at an article right now on the Washington post. When you get picked up on the WAPO, like, <laughs> you know, you've, you've made it in terms of hitting them. Sure. Sure. So this has gone like wildfire. Uh, through the media networks and has gotten to the attention of uh, Moms Demand Action and Shannon Watts or whatever. Uh, and somebody sent this all over to, to Lego, the company, and they sent a cease and desist letter to Culper Precision, uh, which Culper Precision has uh, abided by. Mm -hmm. uh, again, they were very careful to not re reference Lego uh, in the design and building of this gun but uh, I don't know whether it's a some kind of an, uh, other legal or patent infringement on the actual dimension and size of the little you know bumps that uh, the Legos can be attached to on it or not. But uh, any, either way, for Brandon's sake, I mean he's a small small business, uh, just a small shop over in Utah, building all these various custom guns, and. Uh, I don't blame him one bit at all for saying, all right, we'll take it off. Well, you know, they sold a handful of these. He said less than 20. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 that has probably been sold. And uh, apparently that made Lego happy. And Brand I, you know, here's the thing, Brandon, I'm sure is not complaining either because now everybody knows who his company is, uh, both for good and bad, but mostly mm -hmm. I think this will lead to uh, sales for him. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy for him in that regard, <laughs> but I, you know, there's a lot of uh, negative attention that this has gotten people saying a lot of, uh, a lot of things, you know, having strong opinions about the dangers of making real guns look like toys. I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Uh, yeah. Matthew. So I, I mean, here, here's, here's my take on this. Like personally, and I've seen, you know, the, uh, guns tricked out to look like the, uh, Nintendo, uh, duck hunt guns, like all gray and red. And, um, they, you know, some people have done stuff that makes it look like, um, like, uh, different characters in movie, the um, superhero stuff. And so I, that's not what I'm into, you know? Um, but here's the thing, like, I, I understand that this is a divisive thing, right? And like some people look at it and say, okay, if a kid sees this gun, 
they may be more prone to pick it up and think it's a toy. And, and I think that's, I think that's legitimate. Like I, I, I think um, that could be a case. Um, but I think that's missing the point of like um, the responsibility is always whether you have a black gun, a coyote gray or uh, brown, whatever color your gun is or whatever it looks like. I think, you know, our responsibility as gun owners is, is, you know, it's on us, but here, here's, you know, that, that rub is like, just because we can do it, should we do it? And should, you know, should it be sold to, to the public? I don't know. Like, you know, I'm not going to bad mouth him for selling this. I don't think that his intentions are to, you know, harm kids or anything like that. Um, I do think that it's gotten a good, amount of people talking about gun safety and and that's important so mm -hmm. if, if that's the case and, and it brings awareness i i do see you know kind of this uh, in a way of breaking the stigma of guns being evil and, and being scary looking and kind of i get what brandon's trying to do is kind of like upset the paradigm and say you know, a lot of people use guns and you kind of mentioned earlier, like they're kind of adult toys. You can call it a toy if you want. Right. Like it's just the definition of the word toy. But like, um, you know, a lot a lot of people get joy out of shooting sports. It's fun for them. It's a pastime. It's a hobby. It's it's fun. So for people that, you know, look at these guns as as these are my adult toys doesn't mean you throw them in a toy box. It just means like they're what I play with and I use and I I. I you know, interact with rather than real Legos. And, and I get it, you know, so I think some of the concern is legitimate, but I also think some of the attacks or the personal attacks or the attacks on his character or the idea behind this as being insensitive, I, I don't think that that's warranted. Yeah. And I agree with you there for sure. Um, and here's the thing that this has been divisive, even within the two a community. I mean, we're mm -hmm. looking at comments right now on Facebook. Uh, some of you that don't like this, uh, that think that this is, um, not good for general consumption by the public as a product. And here's the thing, guys, like we either support the second amendment or we don't. And I know that some of you would say, well, there's, there's, there's a, place where we can reasonably draw lines as to what's acceptable and what's not. Um, but I think that's, that's the challenge. Like it's so difficult to draw lines with stuff like this. And therefore, if the second amendment means what it means, then we've got to be, at, we, 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 we can't be restricting stuff like this is basically how I see it. Because where do you draw the line? Because, like this one's pretty obvious, right? And blatant that hey, this this is designed around a toy concept and it's a gun, right? It you take one look at it and you're like, oh, that looks like Legos. That's that's a toy, you know, it's or it's a gun that kind of looks like a toy. Um, but where do we draw the line? Because maybe I want to have a custom Cerakote job done on my gun that by the nature of the design and colors used on that make it look toy-like or less mature uh, than what most guns look like. Where do you draw a line with that? Somebody wants a purple gun with pink uh, uh, ponies all over it in Cerakote. Like, okay, by all means, knock yourself out, right? So you just, you can't, you cannot in a well-defined way draw a line in the sand that says this type of gun design is acceptable, but this one over here is not. It, it's, it, there's just no clear way you can draw that line. And so that's kind of where I look at this and go, and here's the other thing. This is a very specialized thing. Like this is not inexpensive just to buy the slide is $765. At least that's what he was originally specking the price to be. Um, you, this is not like, you're not going to see this sudden influx of these hitting the streets and suddenly kids are finding them and thinking they're toys when they're actually not and shooting themselves or you're not going to have cops shooting kids that are holding to actual toys thinking, well, that could be a gun. Like you're not going to see this, this 
problem developed that people like to point to using extreme arguments to suggest that this is irresponsible and is going to lead to people's deaths. Okay. And it does not take away from the fact that a gun is a gun. They have to be purchased by adults that go through background checks, right? Per federal law. And just like any other gun, it's on us as adults to be responsible with how they are handled and how they are stored. Right. So, um, I don't know what more to say to that. I know this is scary to some of you, but hello, we're still adults and we can be responsible. And I think we can have cool, fun looking things as far as guns go and treat them responsibly and just in, and have some adult level fun. So anyway, I don't know. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, interestingly enough, we, this leads us to another story uh, from the Fire and Blog. It, this is a total switch, right? Because we were just talking about a gun that looked like a toy. Now we're going to talk about a toy that kind of looks like a gun, but it's essentially a super soaker, right? Uh, the classic super so soaker toys of my youth. Uh, boy, I, I enjoyed getting into neighborhood water fights with super, so super soakers back in the day. But Noveski, the fire manufacturer, has released this summer the water hog 5000 which is a like i said it's base it's a water gun with a, an ar15 style shape to it but it's got a big green water tank on top um hey i just think it's fun i don't even know we need to, need to talk about it just i'm just <laughs> pointing it out and saying hey i think this is kind of cool and funny and fun and i see no i see no wrong or harm here <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah I, I think that's just kind of a cool concept that you have a company like Noveski well respected and been making quality AR-15s primarily for years and years and years and they're like hey let's have some fun let's come out with a toy uh, again some, probably something that more adults are going to be uh, likely to enjoy and that's totally a-okay yeah. anyway speaking of other things that look like other things the cell phone gun so and we've seen these guys we've talked to them at shows it's been a while obviously since uh due to covid we haven't been to the trade shows in recent history uh i seem to recall spending a fair amount of time talking to them at the last nra show if i recall but ideal conceal is the company uh and they came out with this concept for a it's 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 an actual handgun it's only a like one shot gun uh you know it, it single shot meaning like you fire a shot around and then you got to break it's a break action type uh action you know and so you got to open it up eject the shell put another shell in close it and you can fire it again sort of thing uh anyway they first came out with their so-called cell phone gun and it was only in 380 but now they've announced they've come out with a nine millimeter version. So a little bit more firepower. Yeah. And again, like I'll just, I'm not really into these types of, you know, gadgets and, and kind of um, novelty things. Um, but, you know, it, it is cool that people are innovative enough where, you know, some of these designs probably aid in producing other parts gun components that might make a gun more compact or something, you know, some, some of these types of concepts, like how do we get this gun to fold up and be so small? Well, maybe those things, some of those innovations can be used in other things. So I, I think it's, I think it's interesting and I, it's an innovative spirit. So. Yeah. Um, and I'm with you there. Like I, I have other than from like a novelty type perspective, I have zero interest in owning something like this because there's zero practicality in it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's zero practicality in my opinion for, for a gun like this from a true self-defense perspective. I know the company that makes it tries to sell it from like a, Hey, this is, you know, th their whole selling point is we tried to make something that is, easy to conceal that is small enough like your phone like everybody packs their phones around and finds that 
to be no problem. Like, let's make a, a gun that's as small, or in this case, it's actually smaller than some of the larger phones that are on the market these days. Um, let's make something that's akin to a phone. That's not a pain in the butt, literally and figuratively, to carry around and conceal. But it's just not practical. Like, there's so many other better options out there for, um, you know, carrying and, and, and concealing a gun that actually can be effectively used in self-defense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's noteworthy from a standpoint of, hey, Ideal Conceal came out with a 9 millimeter version. Okay, cool. Now you guys know. All right. Maybe one listener out of our thousands of this podcast will go, hey, that's cool. I'll go buy one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's more of you. Uh, but uh, yeah, whatever. The, it, to your point, the innovation is like, and I don't even necessarily see anything from this that's like industry changing innovation. But the fact that somebody makes something like this and is able to make something like this makes me think maybe that'll inspire somebody else to come up with another idea. Like they'll go, mm-hmm. oh, that's interesting. And that gives me an idea of some other innovation to create that might actually be more practical. Mm-hmm. So I, I always respect innovation for from, for inno- innovation's sake, um, even when it's kind of dumb and impractical. If somebody's doing something that nobody else has been able to do before, just purely from the standpoint of like, hey, it's cool that you could, and that might inspire somebody else. It's kind of like the folding glocks from right. What was that other company? Something concealed. Uh, not uh, full conceal. Full conceal. Yeah. 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 Again, kind of kind of dumb, not really practical, um, a novelty. And hey, if you want to own one because you think it's cool to have such novelty, then like, okay, knock yourself out. Um, and it's probably given somebody else ideas about other things to create. For sure. I like Elkie's comment here on Facebook. Playing around with concepts can lead to great products. For example, post-its. Great <laughs> point. Or Hot Pockets. Ooh, gross. I don't know. <laughs> Last time I had a Hot Pocket, I was probably in my teens, and I thought they were pretty dang good. Yeah, are Hot Pockets the, the pizza ones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I love those, man. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> I probably wouldn't enjoy it as much now. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what else we got here? Why don't you talk with us, Matthew? Share the story from theguardian.com uh, titled Pandemic Gun Violence Surge Was Not Linked to Rise in Gun Sales Study Fines. Yeah, so the, the as the title might suggest, there was a study uh, published by Inquiry Epide- Epidemiology. It's a scientific journal. And basically they, you know, it's no secret that there are a tremendous amount of guns purchased um, over the, the, the period of the pandemic. And it's also no secret that violent crimes, specifically like murders and, and, and violent assaults, um, have gone up across the board um, drastically. And I, I think there's some s- statistics in here, but in general, um, you know, the number of homicides across the country are at a um, h- the highest level since the 60s and estimated a 25% increase uh, across the board. So that, that's pretty considerable. And so, you know, naturally people are looking and saying, okay, well, there are a bunch of um, guns bought, tremendous amount, record numbers, and now we have this increase in homicides and there must be, that must mean that more guns are um, causing or or are the the cause of uh, the increase in homicides. And what this study did was kind of looked at uh, um, these factors and and really said that, there's no real correlation based on the fact that like a lot of the first time gun owners, um, they, they are, were in areas that like weren't high, um, uh, crime areas to begin with. And, and, and those areas, you know, didn't see an increase in crime. Um, a lot of gun purchases were by 
owners that already had guns. So it, there was no like um, correlation between, you know, you have, you've had a gun for 10 years and now the pandemic hits and you buy an extra gun and now you're a homicidal maniac. So they were going through and saying it's probably due to a lot of other factors, which, um, you know, uh, sociological factors, economics, uh, the pandemic, uh, increase in uh, drug abuse and um, in, in all these types of things, right? Job losses. And so it, there, there is just no correlation. This is um, a pretty deep, I mean, it, it wasn't put together by the NRA, right? So it's kind of hard for, for somebody to completely debunk it. Um, and there's a lot of good uh, analysis in here with statistics and things. Um, but yeah, in general, when people are saying, you know, the jump to the conclusions isn't, isn't um, necessarily holding up in this, in this study. So, and I'm always, you know, anytime I see statistics that say, Hey, you know, this equals this, I'm, even if it's pro gun, like I, I know a lot of people will say, well, all the gun violence occurs in, in cities and states that are hard on crime. And that's not necessarily true, right? Like there are states that, you know, um, have, I, I didn't say, uh, hard on crime. I meant, um, have very strict gun laws. There are some states that have strict gun laws and they have fewer homicides than states that have fairly, you know, loose gun laws or less restrictive. So it's not totally just, you know, the gun. Um, there's so many other factors. And I think if we were honest, we, we'd say, yeah, that's, that's probably true. So this kind of just confirms that. At least in my mind. Yeah. Now let's get into uh, some of the actual uh, numbers, just, mm -hmm. just a little bit here. Sure. So it says that uh, last year there's an estimated 25% increase in homicides. Um, I'd say that bears out. Uh, and I'd say that has that has only continued. Uh, I think this year, you know, I'm in the Denver metro area. Uh, we've seen as many homicides by the halfway point of the year as uh, what we had seen in a whole year, like 10 years ago or yeah. close to it. Um, it. Now, now I've talked before, I think a little bit about how the crime rate in Denver has actually risen since like 20, not, uh, 2009, 2010 era. Um, but uh there's all kinds of factors as to why these things happen. And that's what a lot of what this study is actually saying is that we can't find correlation between the rise in gun sales and this rise in violence. There's so many factors and I would absolutely agree with that. And we've talked about it before. I've mentioned it in the podcast that, I mean, just the civil disrest or unrest, um, the, you know, the, the, shortages in the stores and like just uncertainty that uh, existed a year ago and, and for much of last year drove a lot of people to do desperate things, mm -hmm. both good people doing desperate things as far as saying, Oh, I need to buy guns and ammo. And hence we late, we, we lead to a shortage and lesser good people, people that are more inclined to commit crimes or already are criminals themselves that, uh, you know, that also get desperate, right? Uh, there was a mention here about how there is, you know, one thing that's been looked at before, but there's a belief that there's a correlation between youth that have good access to jobs uh, and the, the, the crime rate amongst those youth. That's, that sounds completely reasonable to me, right? It, it's basically saying that when you have young teenage kids that have productive things to do, they're less likely to get in trouble. Like everybody understands that. And we had a whole year pretty much of quarantine and nobody in school, nobody in, you know, nobody able to go to work really. Uh, so you're stuck at home, nothing to do. And you're like, what should I do? Well, I'm going to sneak out of the house and go find my buddies and we're going to find something to do. And next thing you know, they're, they're, committing crimes like that. It, I know some of you are like, well, you, that's a pretty bold statement, a generalized, a generalization that, you know, any kid's going to suddenly become uh, an armed robber. Um, <laughs> it, it, it depends on the kids, right? Like there are some kids that is what it will lead to. There are others that are 
I don't know, TPing people's houses or something. No, wait, TP was not available. So <laughs> probably less of an issue. But anyway, <laughs> maybe that was the problem. Maybe the lack of toilet paper meant that kids couldn't toilet paper other people's houses. So that had to lead to other violent crimes. Maybe it was the <laughs> lack of TP. <laughs> think guys I'm, I'm, I'm saying this all in jest um other a few other things there was an estimated they say 4.3 million additional firearm purchases nationally from march through july 2020 that's a lot in that time span and we know this and we talked about this last year um uh, the study does say that they think that many of these were likely purchased by already existing gun owners and they, they said it was hard to say how many are new gun owners, but we know that the uh, the NSSF, the National, what is it, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, already had reported last year uh, or earlier this year that there was a roughly about eight million from their survey data. They figure about eight million first time gun owners last year. But the big thing is the study does not show a relationship between the sudden increase in gun sales. And that leading automatically to increases in violence, that there were likely other factors, mm -hmm. and which we I, we agree with. I agree with, anyway. Um, yeah. So and we've talked we've talked about this before. I mean, it, it, and it's tricky, right? When you're talking about small town America versus major metropolitan cities, uh, even w between that change in demographic and the size of a city and everything and the politics of a city uh there's there's differences right like the increase in gun ownership in some towns and cities and states across america is likely to lead to decreased crime but more guns out there in big cities might actually be more gun related crime um it's just it, it depends and there, again there's just so many factors hmm. yeah I agree. So um, let's talk about New York. Governor Cuomo announces first of its kind gun violence disaster emergency <laughs> and targets manufacturers. And so he, he signed an executive order. So this was not passed by the state legislature. This was an executive order by the governor. So unilaterally, he is enacting a couple of major changes. Uh, the first one being that he's saying people and cities and organizations can sue gun manufacturers for things, assuming crimes and people getting killed um, by the guns and the products of those manufacturers. This is completely, it flies in the face of the what is it the PLCAA or whatever yeah. the the what does it stand for legal uh, protection of legal commerce um yeah the protection of legal commerce in america act i think yeah. or something like that yeah the law that was passed like i don't know 15 16 years ago that prevents people from suing gun manufacturers for those people being shot or injured or killed by somebody using those guns illegally, mm -hmm. right? We've talked about this before, and I'm of the opinion that permitting such action to occur, and by the way, we'll cover it probably in our next legislative uh, news episode, a story out of California where a California judge has okayed a lawsuit against Smith & Wesson to move forward. That's going to get challenged for sure because it's also in violation of the PLCAA, Okay. And so, you know, the problem here is you open that can and you will have, because I promise you, moms demand action, every town, uh, all these anti gun organizations are, are just chomping at the bit and will flood people with money, with, and attorneys with money to back lawsuits against gun manufacturers. That'll be a major tool for them to go after gun manufacturers, trying to bring them down and accomplish their objectives of gun control. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, th this is, this is problematic and it's problematic that I think you have a governor that is unilaterally via executive order 
choosing to enact a law basically mm -hmm. right that and that that's the part that bothers me right like legislatures pass laws governors and presidents may pass executive orders that usually should guide already existing law and how it's applied by um uh, by organizations or agencies within that executive branch right and when you have presidents or governors sign executive orders that actually creates law i think that's uh, i think that's a shame i think that's that's not how our government is set up to to operate in my opinion but anyway the point is is that that's that's the first piece here of this uh, of this executive order um, and there's a quote here by the way and i've included a link in the show notes today to the actual executive order uh, statement on the New York governor's website. And there's a key statement or phrase in this that I think I latched onto. And it says, since 2005, a federal law called the protection of lawful Com commerce in arms act has shielded bad actor gun manufacturers and dealers from most lawsuits, bad actor gun manufacturers, like which gun manufacturers are quote unquote, bad actors, like seriously, legitimately, like Ruger, Smith and Wesson, Glock, Sig, like, are they bad actors? What are they doing intentionally to promote violence, criminal violence through the manufacture of their arms? Like, how are they bad actors? Like, I just, I think that terminology, I mean, it's obviously very politically based, but like, really? Come on. Like who out there actually fits that category? Yeah. I, I think if you look back, I think one of the early um, suits against a gun manufacturer was uh, like, was Bushmaster, right? With their, with their AR and with some advertisement that they said, you know, kind of uh it made it seem like, you know, violence was cool or something like that. And that, I mean, I, so when you have like a term and we don't know what the actual, um, you know, law says or the nuance below or, you know, describing what a bad actor is, right? Like, so a bad actor could be anything. A bad actor could be culprit precision with the Lego gun. A bad actor could be creating a gun that looks like a cell phone. A bad actor could be an advertisement that, you know, promotes supposed gun violence or something like that, you know? So um, it's all, I think, open to interpretation and i think that that's why these types of things have to be pretty narrow in scope and specific and in, in describing what a bad actor is and, and you know i don't think anybody's making a gun with the purpose of you know it being used to harm people or be used negligently or anything like that yeah now to mark's comment on facebook that that the arguments here a lot of times are about the marketing and the way guns are marketed <sighs> um I understand that. And that's, I'm not going to say it's fair. It's understandable why, hmm. here's the challenge, right? Like you have manufacturers, let's say like Sig Sauer, that are competing for military contracts uh, or even law enforcement agencies. And, and there's this, this um, a lot of times marketing is geared towards that element right and they you know we're talking about marketing where it's like this is the biggest baddest weapon ever that can you know like wreak havoc and destruction you know um well yes that's what our military wants right um and there is marketing that exists that's targeting even the civ civilian market that get that that you know, those amongst us civilians that ascribe to that tribe, if you will, that kind of want to, well, cool, I want to buy the gun that makes me feel super awesome and bad A, you know? So, like, I get that, but <laughs> it's these gun manufacturers are not in the business of promoting criminal violence 
right? They're not. I yeah. know the people that work for these companies. They yeah, don't I, want that. I, I right? don't think, yeah, and I don't think any more so than a, a, a you know liquor or beer company, uh, you know, would support drunk driving or or you know doing crazy stuff while you're while you're wasted. You know what I mean? Like I don't I don't think that any uh, that Budweiser is you know uh, being. I, I hope people get you know get in their car after down in a six pack. So. Yeah, I it the other part of this is where he Cuomo says that um th there's no other um sector or no other industry that has protection like the gun industry and that's obviously not true, you know. That's oh, yeah. Not true. Well, I picked up on that too. Right. Okay, so he talked about industries that aren't liable and I was thinking, hmm. I know of a particular governor that hasn't been held liable for his poor actions and decisions made during the COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder what his name is. Anyway, all right, moving on. Uh, the other piece of the executive order was to prevent people with outstanding warrants from purchasing guns. They called this a major loophole. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just point this out. First of all, on the form 4473 that everyone fills out when purchasing a firearm or going through a background check, you are asked if you are under indictment uh, for a felony or any other crime where the judge could imprison you for more than a year. You are asked if you are fugitive from justice. Mm -hmm. Now I realize that's sort of an on your honor type, uh, you know, thing when you're answering questions on the 4473. They're talking here about making sure there's information in in the background check system, so that they can catch um, that stuff. And I'm kind of like, ah, big whoop. At the same time, I'm also thinking, well, innocent until proven guilty. Anyway, moving on from that. That's a great point, Elky. Vaccine manufacturers not liable for defects either. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Moving on to yahoonews.com, uh, reporting Garfield man, and this was in Oregon, I think, no, Washington. Garfield man sentenced to two years in federal prison after building a red, white, and blue <laughs> cannon in his garage. Matthew, tell us what this one's about. Yeah, this is crazy. So um, this guy, he's 63 years old. This happened in Spokane, Washington. Um, basically what happens, and this happened back in August 2019, but uh, it's just coming up now because I believe th th there's a, a sentencing or... Yeah, he was uh, just sentenced. Right. So but, yeah. Um, so that's why th this story is just now. And, and th this, the case went on for some time and he finally pled guilty back in March. And then now that he's, he's had his sentencing, which is the two years in federal prison. Right. And he was facing 10 years in prison, yeah. this 63 year old guy. So, I mean, you know, he's 63 years old now. It happened a couple of years ago. So that's almost like a life sentence, right? Like if you're 60, 61 years old, you're going to spend 10 years in prison. Um, that's, that's pretty, pretty rough. Anyways, um, the police respond to this guy's house for a check the welfare. He is the sole caretaker of his mother. He lives in the home with his mother. He's her sole caretaker. Police arrive. I, I, it doesn't go into depth about the nature of the call other than it was a check the welfare. While they're there, they find a cannon that this dude, a homemade cannon, actually several homemade cannons. Um, one of the bores on or a, the, the bore on one of the cannons uh, measured one and a quarter inches greater than the half inch bore permissible under federal law. So I'm just going to do some quick math. And I think that's like an inch and three quarter uh, bore size. Um, apparently this cannon was tested by um, investigators and found that it could, it could fire a soda can or a pop can. Um, so there you go. He it had fire two a soda can. Okay. Right. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> let me let, let me just provide some context here. How powerful do you think this thing is if all it can do is fire a soda can? Yeah. Right? Because a soda can can only take so much before it ruptures from the pressure of being fired. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just... Th this thing is almost in toy category. They said it, it could punch a large hole in the center of a target with a soda can. Yeah. I don't, well, I don't I know. Punch <laughs> holes through things with like Nerf 
darts and things <laughs> when they're, you know, it depends like what that target is. Right. Anyway, sorry. I just had to get yeah. that. No, idea. and you know, that maybe the article doesn't go into any specifics on like how fast this thing could fire, what the target was. Was it paper? Was it a cinder block wall? We don't know, right? Like it could have been the, 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 Leaving a large hole in the center of a target could be a paper target. I don't know. The next thing that comes to my mind is a potato gun, man, which yeah. I, I built when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, and, so and I can read the research what the law is on regulated so called cannons. And I know people that own cannons. And maybe there's a, certain, a special license that they have, but I'm not, I'm not really, a, I, I, I guess I need to study. But yeah. I'm wondering, did I break federal law? Oh, boy. I should say well, I was not the primary manufacturer of those potato cannons. I was just, I was there. <laughs> well, he, it, it seems to be, and I haven't looked up the law, but it seems to me that the, the, it, the cannon, if you make one, can't have a bore that's an, a half inch or larger. Um, yeah. 50 so, caliber. Right. So that's this, <laughs> so this guy, he had two cannons that were legal Right. And one that was illegal and he's going to he face 10 years in prison over this is going to serve to he's the primary caregiver of his his elderly mother. Um, and it seems crazy to me that this dude um, is 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 getting hammered like this. It, it, it's just crazy. It doesn't show that he has mm -hmm. any criminal history that he was intending to use it against anyone. Um, and, you know, th this is one of those things where. The police arrived for a check the welfare. And this is why, you know, people will say, well, you know, whatever I have in my own home, that's that's my, you know, my deal. But a lot of guns, a lot of people have been, you know, a, a call like this, police arrive, check the welfare, do whatever. And they see a, a short barreled uh, rifle. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you have a you have an illegal firearm here and we're in a you know, we can see it. We're in a legal pos position where we're seeing it. And now we're going to go get a warrant and, and seize the, your, your rifle and charge you with it. So this is how kind of these things happen. But I don't know, man, like if, if 63 year old, if this dude was that big of a, of a threat, I guess he should be in prison. But um, I just think it's, it's crazy that we're putting elderly people in from in prison for making mm -hmm. a, a potato gun, you know, or a, or a little hand cannon but i don't know it's an yeah. inch and it, it, it's an inch and three quarter inch barrel so uh or you know diameter barrel so uh, that's not it, it, it's not shooting like cannonballs you know but well that's why i said like the only thing they mentioned is that it could fire a soda can and that's mm -hmm. where i'm like then how dangerous is this thing anyway you know mm -hmm. i don't know I just find it interesting. They went to do a welfare check and then somebody happens to notice, oh, there's this cannon looking thing in the garage. Maybe we should look into this. Is this guy licensed to have this? <laughs> I don't know. I think it was a big to do about nothing. Um, and I think that's unfortunate, but whatever. Yeah. Final story for, and we're a little bit over time or getting close to it. Um, this, this is close to home. This happened right here in Denver. Uh, the story is this, according to the uh, Associated Press, APnews.com, four arrested guns seized at hotel near All-Star Game events. This happened like a week ago or almost a week ago. Um, four people that were already criminals. They all had convictions. They're all like felons. Um, and they happened to have like 16 rifles and a thousand rounds of ammo in their hotel room they were staying at, which is right there down by where the uh, uh, Coors Field, that's our, you know, the home of our uh, uh, Colorado Rockies uh, baseball team uh, is located. And, uh, you know, these guys are not very smart because they didn't take steps to either hide those guns or prevent uh, the hotel, you know, maid from entering the room for cleaning and discovering this. And there's the hotel maid that alerted authorities alerted their their hotel staff security which alerted police and police showed up and raided and found everything and arrested everybody because they're all felons anyway um the fbi came out and said we don't think this was related to an act of terrorism but i don't know what's going on here it's noteworthy because i mean it kind of has the look and feel of like a you know, Las Vegas style 
attack or shooting. Uh, they they were on a uh, a balcony, or they they had they were they had a balcony a, a unit that was facing uh, the Coors Field area, and uh, you know who knows? I don't know. One of the people, it was noted he had made statements on social media regarding a recent divorce and how he was uh, planning on going out in a big way. Uh, so that's certainly alarming and concerning. Um, fortunately, nothing is coming of this. All right. So, you know, it's good they were caught. I mean, they were felons in possession of weapons that knew they shouldn't have had them. And maybe they were planning on doing something major. Maybe not. But uh, either way, they're going to jail for a long time. Yeah. And this is one of those things like, you know, they, they had all these drugs. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they weren't... Um, probably legal you know even if if they didn't possess the the drugs with the firearms which is illegal anyways but um they i, I don't they probably had i believe they had criminal record right so they probably mm-hmm. weren't able to purchase the firearms legally anyway so this yeah you know, um so yeah yeah i mean the fact is criminals gonna criminal right like they, they do criminal things mm-hmm. and gun laws don't apply to them except mm-hmm. when they get caught yeah. So I don't know. There you go. That's our story. And we're sticking to it. <laughs> That's all of our industry news here today. We got a couple of gear reviews to do for y'all. Matthew, why don't you uh, share with us your first, or I guess, I guess we, you are doing one and I'm doing one. So what's our first gear review here? All right. So I'm going to, we gave this away last week uh, and I busted mine out this week anyways, but uh, it's this ready up gear um, handgun cleaning kit. So I previously really liked uh, the pig lube one and it came in kind of a a same little hard case with the zipper that held everything together. Um, But this one is a little bit more um, full as far as what's in it. Um, It has, you know, different caliber brushes, um, the AP brush and some Jags, all different calibers. It comes with patches, um, you know, a a T handle with a couple, um, uh, rods that you can, you know, make it a, a little longer or shorter, uh, not long enough. Obviously it's a handgun cleaning kit, so it's not going to be able to go through uh, a rifle, but, um, there are, there is a ready up your rifle kit kit, but what I really liked, and I, I don't know, I like this. Uh, I like, um, little tools like this. It comes also with a dental tool with a scraper and a pick and man, I, I don't know how handy, it, like these things are always so handy and getting crevices and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, at least even, even just for that, plus, you know, you're getting everything else. Um, and it's really a simple kit. It folds up really nicely. I like the kit, uh, or the, the case that it comes in. So, um, yeah, ready up gear, handgun cleaning kit. I, I, I carry it to the range all the time, uh, because I'm not normally doing a lot of weapons maintenance, but if there's downtime at a class or something like that, or, um, you know, something goes wrong, you want to monkey around with your gun, a, a little cleaning kit, usually you can use it to, to open up your gun and get, get to pretty much everything in there. So if you're carrying a block 19, maybe, right. <laughs> right on, man. Right on, man. Yeah. You know, got the same kits and, uh, they're, they're solid little kits. Well, I will share now my gear review, and I have here the Weber Tactical Trifecta holster. It's advertised as a three-in-one concealment holster. And I'm just showing you the packaging that this came in, which, by the way, really impressed me. In fact, let me just kind of mention this is one of my one of my first, uh, you know, good things about this holster. Uh, that was, and this was sent. By the way, this was sent just in full disclosure. This was given to me by Weber Tactical. Adam Weber is the founder of the company over there. Uh, good dude. He reached out and asked if I'd like to uh, take a look and review one. I said sure. And so this was sent to me. Um, I, I'm I make it pretty clear to people I review things for that whether they provide the product with no compensation or not, um, I'm going to do a fair review of it. That's just how I operate. But when you open up the packaging, I thought this was just like a piece of cardboard, you know, with some images or some graphics on the front and some, you know, basic images on the back. It shows like how this can be worn in the traditional inside waistband position, the appendix position, or outside the waistband. Uh, it says it's made from Bolteron, which is good. Bolteron's a little bit 
more, it's a bit, it's a little bit stronger. It's a, it's more chemically resistant, uh, than, uh, Kydex, but very similar. And people mistake Bolteron for Kydex all the time. Uh, can't adjustable ride height, adjustable red dot capable retention, adjustable and suppressor height sight channel, uh, is kind of listed as the, as the main features. Cool. All right. So I pull this out and I realize, oh, wow, look at this, this thing, this insert folds out into three separate pages, which are all related to how to set up, mount, uh, and modify this holster between its different configurations with very, very well done, illustrated, easy to understand instructions <laughs> written in plain English, good English. So this was not, you know, done in China. <laughs> so, um, and, and so this is the holster here and I have it set up right now in its outside waistband configuration. But here, let me explain how this works. Really what the trifecta holster is, is, is a two part system. As far as you have two main components, you have the main holster shell, which looks like many other common Kydex type or Bolteron type uh, uh, holster shells that, you know, you're, you're accustomed to seeing in the industry quite regularly now. Um, it, it, it's better than many of your common ones that you see out there. I will say that much, but you have your, your basic holster shell, but then you have this secondary, I'm just going to call it a plate. Um, it's made from Bolteron as well. Same material as the holster. And it is shaped and formed to Inner, or to uh, connect to the holster shell. And it's this second plate that you use to create the outside waistband configuration. And it's simply mounted together with two screws. So two screws and you attach this plate and you go from an inside waistband or appendix holster to right to an outside waistband holster. And you can leave these, these loops for your outside waistband belt connection um, permanently attached to the to this outer shell plate. Um, very, very simple but effective design. It's easy to convert between one configuration and another. I mean, I I guess I could, but I'm not going to bother because, you know, time and the podcast and all. But I could very easily loosen these screws and then show you how easy it is to set up this holster um, for inside waistband use. So the one thing is, is that for outside waistband use, you would remove a few of the screws that are holding on the actual hardware for clipping the holster inside the waistband, as well as it comes with a wing. I, this came with a mod wing, by the way. So, uh, or, or claw would be another term that people might be familiar with. Um, so it's cool that it's convertible and it's very simply and easily done in that way. And this is, to be honest with you, one of the best or better implemented versions of this type of con convertible holster I've seen before. I've, there's a few out there that kind of have similar approaches, uh, but this is probably the best e executed one that I've seen. The holster conceals very well inside or outside waistband. I appreciate the fact that when this is, when you put this on your side, the fact that the outer shell or plate is a single layer means it had a little bit of flexibility to it. And that means that you can really cinch down your belt and sort of suck this in to your side. So it conceals very well if you're wanting to do outside waistband use, but like under a jacket or, or something like that, it does ride fairly high. Now, granted, that may be not, that may not be true for all models. This one's particularly for the P365 or P365XL. Uh, so it does ride high that that's also a bonus from a concealment perspective. So you don't have holster sticking out below a shirt or jacket. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and that does keep it close to your body, but that, that may be a little bit uncomfortable for some of you that have less mobility as far as being able to get your arm up high enough to actually draw it. Um, but I, it works fine for me in that way. Inside waistband, again, it, it's designed very well. I like the fact that Adam chose to artificially lengthen the shell or the, 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 the holster shell itself because with shorter guns, if you're going to use this in an appendix position, especially you need a little extra length for it to actually balance out the gun and not be pushed out by your gut or whatever. And, um, you know, print, uh, a little bit more than you would like. So it, it, and I've, I wore it first, uh, I wore it inside waistband for a couple of weeks 
since then, I've primarily used it as my go-to outside waistband for my P365XL. Uh, and it is a great holster. It's uh, I've really enjoyed wearing it. It's been very comfortable to wear. It was very, it was very comfortable to wear inside waistband. I primarily used it in the appendix position. Uh, I could have added a wedge to it to make it just a little bit more concealable, but I chose not to. And honestly, it worked quite well even without a wedge. Uh, because it's a little bit longer than the gun. And so it does balance out pretty, pretty well. Uh, I used it with, now Weber ships it with a single uh, discrete carry concept clip, which worked adequately. I went ahead and added a second one, and, and I recommend using the discrete carry concept mod four universal clip, which is the one that has slots in it. And it, you can, so that way, because because what I what I did notice is that the holes here in the middle section of the holster don't line up perfectly with the holes where the wing or claw attaches to, and so I needed a little bit of adjustment over here to get the two clips to be on the same plane or same height. Uh, so that was just a little something I I figured out and had to learn and experiment with a little bit. Um, ideally, I, I would see these hole patterns where in the middle of the holster where the clip usually attaches line up more with the, the hole patterns of where the wing or claw is. Um, I just prefer having two clips when I'm working with a holster like this in the appendix position, it just stays put and is a little bit more consistent for me. Uh, I tried the single clip and it worked okay, but adding a second clip definitely made it better. Overall, if I was rating this say out of like 10, points or stars or whatever i'd give this like a nine uh which i will say is very that's a very high rating for me because i'm very very picky about holsters mm -hmm. so it's not perfect but like there's there's definitely some like if i again if i was improving it i would make sure that these hole patterns are the same or on the same plane that's that's probably my big 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 gripe um and uh i i might explore a little bit more with some different uh, shapes to the holster shell plate thing that you attach for o outside waistband use because I think you could actually incorporate a little bit more asymmetry to it to actually increase concealment or tucking of the grip into the body. Um, other than that, it's pretty pretty solid. Cool, man. Sorry, I probably went a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, that's my review of the Weber Tactical Trifecta. Nice. Sounds good. So finally, we need to wrap this up. But before we go, do a weekly prize giveaway announcement. Guys, if you don't do this already, why not? Because we're giving stuff away free every week. All you got to do is sign up. It's super easy. Go to concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. Uh, this week, we are giving or announcing the winner for a Ready Up Gear handgun cleaning kit, like Matthew was just talking about a minute ago. Uh, next week we are giving away a legal boundaries by state book. So, or is it the electronic access? Uh, either one. Okay. Either either one. One. Your choice. All right. All right. That's, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, guys sign up again, concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. Uh, yeah. Each week you have the opportunity to automatically be entered, but you got to sign up every week. Because mm -hmm. we wipe out that list every week and start over fresh. Runs th basically Monday through Monday. So, Matthew, who is our winner of the Ready Up Gear handgun cleaning kit? David S., you won one of these. We will get that in the mail to you, David S. And next week, like you said, uh, we're giving away your choice of uh, electronic or hard copy of the legal boundaries by state. Awesome. Congrats, David S., on winning this week's prize. Guys, again, next week we'll give away your choice of the electronic copy or a physical copy of the Legal Boundaries by State book. Very, very helpful resource. Uh, so go to concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize and sign up today. Final shout out to our episode sponsors. We had the Ready Up Gear Laser Dot Trainer, the Dry Fire Laser Cartridge. Available at readyupgear.com. And guys, don't delay. We're going to have an awesome time. Uh, there's going to be not just training, but we're going to have some some 
other fun things going on dur- dur- during the whole weekend of the 2021 Guardian Conference, plus some prize giveaways there. We'll be giving away some pretty valuable stuff, I might mention. We're working on it. I think we're going to pull it together, but looking like we'll have a gun or guns that will be given away. Um, so make sure you sign up for the 2021 guardian conference, guardianconference.com. So with that brings us to an end of this episode. Final words, Matthew, uh, stay safe guys. Thanks for listening. There you go. <laughs> so until next time, a reminder to train, right, train often and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast and fight true. Take care.